And I would like to give the floor to Irina Kuchma, who will be presenting us the Foster Train the Trainer resources and uh, talk a little bit more on didactics. So I hope you enjoy the session. Irina, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Tanya. And uh, hello, dear, dear colleagues. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, I'd like to share some uh, observations from uh, our foster training project, uh, which was uh, a European project uh, that uh, some of you attending today were also involved in. Uh, and uh, what we did, we created uh, online uh, open science courses. Uh, we also collected uh, some uh, reusable training materials uh, on different open science topics, focusing on uh, life sciences and social science and humanities. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, a trainer's corner and um, some other useful resources. And uh, just a disclaimer that uh, this project as a pr project ended uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, courses, I think, are still uh, up to date. and. Um, we have new translations coming up. Uh, so we have those courses in English and uh, in Spanish, and uh, some of them have been uh, just translated uh, into German by Austrian colleagues. Uh, and uh, when we were creating the courses, we thought that it would be useful if we would uh, use uh, learning path approach uh, and uh, guide their learners uh, around the courses that they would like to take based on uh, skills that uh, learners could gain after completing those courses. So learning paths are actually navigation route uh, around the content. Uh, and I think it's also a good idea to keep in mind when you are designing your training events. Um, so these are some of their courses uh, that uh, are available uh, on the portal now, and they are free, open, reusable. You can download uh, many of them as a uh, SCOM package and put in your institutional Moodle, for example, if, if you're using or other online lo lo learning platform. Sorry. And these are our flagship uh, open science courses. Uh, what is open science? Managing and sharing research data, open science, uh, open source soft software and workflows, uh, data protection and ethics, uh, open licensing, open access publishing, uh, sharing preprints, open peer review, open innovation, using open data in teaching and uh, assessing the fairness of data. Uh, in addition to reusable courses, we also have uh, an open science training handbook with uh, good practice advice how to actually organize training events. Uh, and please also keep in mind that uh, uh, this handbook was designed for face to face events, and I hope we could still get back to them. And uh, it includes uh, some open science basics. Uh, uh, and then uh, learning objectives uh, and learning outcomes uh, for the training and then some um, key components and uh, skills ga gained and also questions, obstacles and uh, common misconceptions and how to address them. So these are the open science basics uh, that uh, we covered. Uh, we also have uh, a didactical part about uh, preparing uh, like I said, mainly face-to-face -face workshops and uh, some organizational aspects to keep in mind there. And to compensate for that, uh, I would like to uh, show this resource that uh, Tanya and colleagues prepared uh, on uh, bringing uh, training online. Um, um, I think it's, it's a useful addition to what we have and uh, all the links are on my slides. Uh, uh, we also try to suggest some uh, exercises for different topics. Uh, and um, again, please keep in mind that uh, some of those exercises might be uh, used a couple of years ago. So maybe uh, you, you wouldn't see the, the newest ones in there, 
but uh, I know that shop project uh, collected some examples of uh, games and exercises, and uh, we would like to update uh, that uh, handbook with with new examples. Um, and it was already mentioned a lot today that it's it's really important to make sure the trainings are really hands on and interactive. And I guess this hands on and interactive is uh, a bit tricky in the online environment. So, but I think the basics of face to face training would still apply. And uh, what we suggested in this handbook is this famous Bloom Bloom taxonomy, which is kind of action oriented uh, training planning um, and um, what I usually use uh, when I plan my training events uh, is a checklist from uh, Australian Research Data Commons where they yeah, highlight some um, bullet points on uh, adult learning uh, because adults are usually self self directed there uh, and uh, they bring experience and it's really important if uh, training that you plan uh, includes hearing about existing experiences and building on that uh, uh, practical aspects uh, respect and this last uh, press for time aspect uh, is I think especially important in uh, designing um, online trainings. Um, what we also recommend it uh, in this hand handbook that, um, again, from, from our European perspective, it's, it's really handy when uh, you plan your training based on uh, learning outcomes rather than learning objectives, because learning objectives uh, is what you would like to get out of this training as an instructor. So, a training planner, uh, but uh, learning outcomes are actually skills, competencies, knowledge that uh, trainees will get. Uh, and uh, for us, it was uh, much more useful to keep this uh, trainee's perspective in mind and uh, plan the training based on learning uh, outcomes. Um, uh, because they, they really uh, help you to plan um, this desired behavior, change your development, skills development, or knowledge development, and then uh, try to measure these changes. Uh, so outcomes are actually what trainees will, will be able to do upon completing the course. And it's really helpful if these outcomes are really clear, me me measurable criteria, because then uh, you can uh, check what learners are learned. And uh, these are examples of uh, learning uh, outcomes from uh, our research data ma uh, management and sharing course. Uh, so for example, upon completing the course, learners will be able to understand, be able to know, be aware, know how to. And um, also when we were designing those courses, we saw that it would be uh, useful to include a quiz in the end, and uh, we developed the quiz in a way that a learner could take as many attempts as needed to actually uh, answer the question. And uh, these are some of the examples of uh, the questions that we have, again, for, for this uh, data sharing course. Uh, and then uh, in the end, they uh, receive when when they answer the course they uh, receive a notification that it's, it's excellent well done and uh, they they get a badge badge uh, after completing a course a digital badge uh, and uh, after completing a set of courses they receive uh, a certain specification uh, so for example if uh, Elona would like to be a reproducible research practitioner, then uh, the courses that uh, she will need to take are what is open science, best practice in open research, open access publishing, man managing and sharing research data, open source software and workflows, and it will take between three and four hours. Um, 
Uh, when uh, we plan our training events, uh, that, that's that's a tough question. Uh, how how you can actually um, find a place for for your training uh, in this competitive uh, training landscape? How do you actually advertise your your course and make sure that people who register actually attend your training? Um, well, that's something for for you. To keep in mind how how you can actually um, draw attention and how you can turn registration into actual uh, attendance because um, that's that's a challenge with free events for example and then another challenge that uh, we have is uh, how do we actually know that we're making a difference uh, with the training that we provide uh, and um, that's 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 a question to you if uh, if you you have good ways of uh, measuring that, uh, that that would be uh, like really great to hear. Maybe I don't know today or on Wednesday when we have a second uh, a second session. Uh, so what we did uh, in uh, first project after six months after courses we followed up with um, an online survey and we asked whether people uh, applied knowledge and skills gained there and uh, if no what stopped them from applying those knowledge and skills for example uh, because uh, in some cases uh, the reason was that uh, they just needed more training but in in, uh, in other cases maybe uh, they they had all the skills they needed but uh, they didn't have uh, supporting environments uh, in the organization or if they were early career researchers their supervisors were not happy with them practicing open science so, or maybe time was an issue so we also wanted to hear about that and then we we had some open-ended questions like uh, whether there were any changes to their current practices uh, and uh, whether they could tell us about their uh, impact uh, and we asked whether we could contact people for follow-up interviews uh, and uh, i think that that worked uh, quite well we also promise that everyone will receive a reusable bamboo cup with foster logo we did email all the cups to people who participated, uh, but of course uh, there is this survey fatigue uh, and um, this question of uh, measuring impact of training is is a big one. Uh, and if uh, if you attended the uh, CSV conference uh, last week, um, there was a session about uh, measuring impact of training and um, this. Uh, Kirkpatrick model was mentioned as uh, an example of uh, the model that could be used to evaluate uh, impact of training and uh, it looks at uh, different levels, uh, reaction, uh, learning, uh, behavior, results and uh, provide some suggestions on, on how impact could, could be measured at uh, each of those uh, levels. And then there was also an interesting blog post from um, the Carpentries, uh, how they me measure the impact of their trainings, again, using uh, this uh, model um, and um, how they, uh, for example, uh, measure short and long term success uh, in uh, uh, different areas. Uh, so what, so what they also mentioned that uh, it's useful to check in, uh, immediate feedback from from the audience, especially now when uh, when we have online events, when it's it's really hard to see what every participant uh, is doing, uh, and uh, with with a survey sort of fatigue, uh, perhaps uh, some uh, observations or interviews or smaller focus groups um, is a better approach. Um, so if you're interested in measuring impact, I, I do recommend you to check uh, these two uh, articles. Um, and also in, in, in Foster, when we had face-to-face uh, -face train the train events, uh, my colleague, Gwen Frank, uh, developed uh, this uh, train the trainer card game and um, it's available uh, online. Uh, and basically what it does uh, uh, it's uh, it's a card game where 
you as a trainer pick a topic, uh, then uh, pick a card uh, that uh, highlights some conditions for your training, for example, uh, the size of an audience or type of audience or knowledge level of the audience. And then um, there is a persona uh, document where you as a trainer could uh, try to imagine uh, who will be attending your training. So for example, just to be, think about uh, two representatives of uh, the audience that will be participating and uh, uh, try to describe who they are and uh, what their goals and motivations for this training and what their frustrations with uh, current practices could be that perhaps you could address and what, what their skills level might be. And then based on that, uh, Again, during this face-to-face uh, -face train the train event, uh, there was time to design um, a mini training, and um, these are some of the examples of training formats that were on the cards and are on the cards: uh, audience size, audience type, uh, knowledge level, and this is persona document uh, that we asked uh, trainers to to fill in. Um, and then uh, when um, these uh, mini trainings were presented uh, at, at, at the train the train event, uh, uh, there was a set of cards with uh, unpredictable circumstances, and some of them were audience type of uh, circumstances. For example, uh, what would you do if uh, everyone is quiet or uninterested, or if everyone is chaotic or ask too many questions, uh, and how, how you deal with uh, issues like that? And then uh, another, another type of troubles were external factors, like for example, what you do if there is no Wi-Fi, or if one person dominates a meeting, or if venue is not suitable. And it was also fun to, to discuss in a group uh, how all these issues were addressed. Uh, so it's a pity we were not together and we can, can design um, this uh, mini training together, but uh, I think we'll, we'll be able to do that on Wednesday. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions, if any, <laughs> if we have time for that.